Hello and welcome to the Evidence Based Chiropractor. I am your host, Dr. Jeff Langmay. Today's episode, we are taking a look at a landmark study, if I don't say so myself. This is from 2011 in the journal Manual Therapy, and it is all about synovial folds. A pain in the neck. That is the title. It will drop a link down in the episode show notes. And this is potentially one of the most complete papers, analyses that I've ever seen regarding synovial folds. I'll take away some of the big high points that I noted reading the study. I'm also going to encourage you again to check out that link below because it is a good one. Before we get started, I want to say a few words about the Smart Chiropractor. The Smart Chiropractor can power your patient journey to provide you with more qualified leads, more new patients, better retention, and consistent reactivations without spending any money on advertising. Let's face it, paid advertising generates cold leads that you need to convert. They are the lowest quality patients. What generates the highest quality patients? Putting out consistent, high quality content and attracting more of your ideal patients. That's what we help you do with The Smart Chiropractor. It's about teaching and inviting consistently. You can check it all out at thesmartchiropractor.com. Again, that is thesmartchiropractor.com. But as I said at the top, today's focus of the show is all around synovial folds. Synovial folds of the cervical spine are regarded as a potential source of neck pain, headache. They can be affected in whiplash injuries, slip and falls, and a lot of times when we're trying to gap the facet joints, put motion segmentally into an area, the synovial folds within the facet joints play a critical role. So this is something us as chiropractors, we deal with each and every day in our practice. Yet, I think sometimes they're overlooked. Checking out this study, there was a lot of great information that I wanted to share, and that's what we'll dive into. So intraarticular synovial folds. They're formed by the synovial membrane or the synovium that projects into a joint cavity and are found in all of the articulations across the vertebral columns. That's sort of just what they are at a top line level. Now, here's something I didn't know right off the top. There are three parts to a synovial fold. I had no idea. A base, a middle part, and an apex three distinct parts. The, th the peripheral base extends from the fibrous capsule and tapers to form a thin apex that projects between the surfaces, the articular surfaces. In uh, cervical synovial folds typically extend one to five millimeters between the articular surfaces and occasionally extend even more than five millimeters from their base into the joint cavity. So important to keep in mind right there, we have a thick base. It thins out towards that apex one to five millimeters roughly in length. And again, they sit between those articulations. So the number of, here's an interesting fact as well that I had, did not know until I read the paper. The number of synovial folds decreases with increasing age but does not appear to be influenced by gender. So I haven't really put together, there's something to this in terms of the number of synovial folds decreasing with age, yet restriction typically increasing with age, but I haven't put together exactly my thoughts. They don't dive into it in great detail in this paper, but there's something to be said about that. We know that as we age, the instantaneous axis of rotation, that pinpoint, of motion where most in motion first occurs at every segment migrates posteriorly that ends up loading the facet joints as we age which is why we see facet hypertrophy as we get older there's something to this that tying into the decreasing number of synovial folds but i'm not exactly sure maybe a good topic for a future research study now when you take a look at cadavers there are basically three histologies associated with or histological compositions associated with synovial folds. Uh, adipose, fibroadipose, and fibrous. Again, interesting to me. I thought synovial folds, a synovial fold is a synovial fold. Not the case. There are three distinct types or you know, hi, you know hist, hist, histological composition types associated with this. And again, that's adipose, you know, mostly fat, fibroadipose, sort of that uh, mashup or crosslink, and then fibrous itself. So fascinating as we dive in again we hear these synovial folds or the facets whether it's you know decreasing pressure or increasing pressure depends upon who you ask but as we're delivering the adjustment we hear noise right we hear the pop the crack the typical thing associated with the spinal adjustment 
and synovial folds no doubt play a role in that how big of a role good good question to be to be answered so let's take a look at some of the previous research around synovial folds because it sort of sets the stage for where we're at today uh, synovial folds are not or appear i should say to not be innervated interesting if you don't have innervation well it's hard to have pain right so they are not uh innervated but the presence of nerve fibers and endings has been demonstrated in some recent studies so early studies not innervated newer studies appear to potentially be innervated very interesting as we dive into it. And I think there has to be some innervation as we talk about the sensory motor components, of which I think uh, for set joints and synovial folds do play a role. So nerve fibers have been identified uh, alongside and independent of the blood vessels in the synovial folds, but there's very little to no agreement on the function of these nerve fibers. So are they proprioceptive? Are they vasomotor? Are they nociceptive? Nobody seems to be able to agree on that yet. But we do know that there are some nerve fibers and nerve endings going into these synovial folds. I think it's going to have to do with proprioception. It might have to do with pain as well to be determined. So synovium and the synovial folds, of course, they sit within these spaces, these articular spaces. So they're believed and this. I don't think this is a stretch. I think they probably do adapt themselves to the contour of the joint space in all positions. And they act as sort of the passive space fillers. They use that term in the study. I love it. Passive space filler that fill the non-congruent points of a joint in its neutral position, but displace when the joint moves. So the synovium is in its most natural position when the joint is in its most neutral position. That makes a lot of sense to me. The other thing is I think about this in surgical intervention cases a lot. And I always say, you know, the body doesn't like extra space, right? It's going to fill space with something. If you do a surgery, it's typically going to fill space with fluid or scar tissue. If you're taking bone and ligament out, the body doesn't like open space. It will fill that in again with scar tissue. It'll fill it in. The doctor might fill it in with bone. It could fill with fill up with fluid. Very, very common. All, all of those after a surgery. In the case of a joint, non-surgical intervention, of course, the joint itself but again, the body doesn't like open extra space, so it makes so much sense to me that the synovial folds fill in and act as that passive space filler. I would never considered whether it's in its neutral state when or natural state when the joint's neutral or moving. Interesting point that when the joint's in the neutral state, the synovium is in its most natural state, and then it deforms to fill in the space as the joint goes through motion. Very, very interesting. It's also been suggested that these synovial folds can protect and or lubricate the articular surfaces and assist in weight bearing, maybe dissipate stress. All of these things, I believe when we think about it, you think about synovial folds and how they act specifically in the spine make a lot of sense to me. And there might be that mechanosensory role. And I think we've seen that with some of our joint position studies as time has elapsed since this study came out about a decade ago. So it, it's believed at this point that they can provide proprioceptive feedback, sensory motor control, and this could be especially important. I think we've seen this in some updated studies in the upper cervical spine, which has that direct neurophysiological connection to the vestibular and visual system. So as we get up towards that brainstem, that upper cervical spine, positioning of the joints, of course, matters tremendously, but also the ability to have fluid motion and the ability for the synovial folds to act as normally as possible uh, is super, super important. Now, here is something that was totally new to me. The synovium and adipose tissues can release growth factors and pro-inflammatory cytokines into the joint. So that is fascinating to me. The products of this, as they say, may, be, may contribute to inflammatory and degenerative processes that underline joint diseases such as osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. I've never considered the synovial folds to be a, maybe not a primary, but a driver of that in any capacity, but it seems as though they might be. And it's super, super interesting. Now let's talk about some synovial fold entrapment. That's what we deal with, with as chiropractors each and every day. 
So the previous hypothesis has been that abnormal joint movement may cause synovial folds to move from the normal position and become imprisoned or entrapped between the articular surfaces, causing pain and hypomobility. And that can have a reflex muscle spasm as well. And I don't think there's any that's not news to us as chiropractors. We see that each and every day. Now, there also is entrapment and then there's extrapment, which is interesting. Extrapment is when the synovial folds fail to re-enter the joint cavity following movement, which can buckle and cause, again, reflex muscle spasm, can cause capsule issues. So entrapment is when the synovial fold is caught within the joint. Extrapment is when the synovial fold is caught outside of the joint when somebody's going through a motion. And again, fascinating. I've never thought about this in this much detail, but it makes a lot of sense. And this ties in, of course, if you take care of anybody that suffered and struggled with whiplash injuries in your practice. So there's a majority of evidence regarding the role of synovial folds in the generation of neck pain and can become super injured during whiplash during a motor vehicle accident. That could be also like a slip and fall. Anytime that there's neck trauma, there's fast, you know, or this fast flexion and extension or hyper flexion and hyper extension. It's basically a whiplash injury. We associate it with motor vehicle accidents, but it can happen in sports. It can happen to slip and fall. Of course, it can happen during those accidents, but that can play a huge role in injury or entrapment and extrapment related to the synovial folds. And as those synovial folds decrease over time as we age, I don't know. They don't go into it in the study. The real question is, is are they more likely to entrap or more likely to extrap? I think that's a fascinating question that can be answered in future studies. But this one that we reviewed today was from 2011. Again, I'll drop the link down in the show notes. To me, this is one of the most complete descriptions. I know we went fast through a lot of that terminology on this episode, but there's just so much good information relative to what we're doing. And I just think about, I know the synovial folds can take place across a variety of articular surfaces, but when we think about it in relative, relative to the spine and the spinal column, they matter, they sit within those facet joints, and most of the time, we are establishing motion in those facet joints. Of course, we're establishing motion throughout the spinal disc in the th full functional spinal unit. But there's no question when I think initially of a chiropractic adjustment of spinal manipulation, spinal adjustment, however you want to define it. When I think of that, I think the first thing I think of is what happens in the facet joints and the synovial folds are undoubtedly the key player in that. So hopefully you picked up some additional information around synovial folds. If you want to dig deeper, again, please feel free to check out the study. And before we wrap up today, I want to say a few words about a couple pretty awesome companies out there. And one of them is PowerStep. They provide fantastic orthotics. I've talked about them on the show before. I'll talk about them again. I love the PowerStep orthotics personally. My father has found a tremendous amount of relief using these, and they are willing to give you, yes, you, a listener, a listener of the Evidence-Based Chiropractor Podcast, a free sample. You can check them out at pro.powerstep.com slash sample. Again, that's pro.powerstep.com slash sample. Head over there. Let them hook you up with a free sample. See what's going on. These were created by a podiatrist over 30 years ago, and they are legit. So click that link in the show notes, check them out and support those who support this podcast. And finally, if you are looking for that next step in your chiropractic career, check out Chiro Matchmakers, 100 jobs, 85K plus base. Check it out, chiromatchmakers.com. And if you're looking to add on an associate or a chiropractic assistant over the course of this coming year, do not go it alone. The job market is tough right now. It's tough to find good people. That is why behavioral matching have a great job description outsourcing some of that initial interview and vetting process, lean into the expertise. Head over to chiromatchmakers.com. And thank you so much for tuning in and listening to this podcast each and every week. I really, really greatly appreciate it. If you have one moment of time and you want to leave a uh, feedback or a review, that helps more docs find out about it, which is really, really great. So thank you so much for tuning in. Have a fantastic week in practice, and I will talk to you soon. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Evidence-Based Chiropractor. If you want to grow your practice, come back for next week's episode. If you want to grow faster, visit the evidencebasedchiropractor.com and join our MD Marketing membership today.